If you have your Bibles, if you could turn with me to 1 Kings 19, 19 through 21. I will be reading in the NIV version, uh, but it will be in the King James version on the screen. And verse 19 says, So Elijah went there and found Elisha, son of Shaphat. He was plowing with twelve yoke of oxen, and he himself was driving the twelfth pair. Elijah went up to him and threw his cloak around him. Elisha left his oxen and ran after Elijah. Let me kiss my father and mother goodbye, he said, and then I will come with you. Go back, Elijah replied. What have I done to you? So Elisha left him and went back and took his yoke of oxen and slaughtered them. He burned the plowing equipment to cook the meat and gave it to the people, and they ate. Then he set out to follow Elijah, and here's the key point. He became his servant. In these scriptures, Elisha is approached by Elijah, and Elijah placed his cloak around Elisha's neck. In Bible times, the cloak was a symbol of authority. So when Elijah places his cloak around his neck, he's calling for him to come and follow him. Continuation later in the timeline, it's 2 Kings 3, 4 through 12. At the start, it's going to be talking about three kings coming together, uh, and then we'll get back into Elisha. And Mesha, excuse my pronunciation, king of Moab, was a sheep master and rendered unto the king of Israel an hundred thousand lambs and a hundred thousand rams with the wool. But it came to pass when Ahab was dead, the king of Moab rebelled against the king of Israel. And King Jerome went out of Samaria the same time and numbered all Israel. And he went and sent to Jehoshaphat, king, the king of Judah, saying, The king of Moab hath rebelled against me. Wilt thou go with me against Moab to battle? And he said, I will go up. I am as thou art, my people as thy people, and my horses as thy horses. And he said, Which way shall we go up? And he answered, The wilderness, the way, the wilderness through Edom. So the king of Israel went, and the king of Judah, and the king of Edom, and they fetched a compass of seven days' journey, and there was no water for the host and for the cattle that followed them. And the king of Israel said, Alas, that the Lord hath called these three kings together to deliver them into the hand of Moab. But Jehoshaphat said, Is there not here a prophet of the Lord, that we may inquire of the Lord by him? And one of the kings of Israel's servants answered and said, Here is Elisha the son of Shaphat, which poured water on the hands of Elijah. And Jehoshaphat said, The word of the Lord is with him. So the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat and the king of Edom went down to him. So the key point in that verse is they are talking about Elisha, and they said, The son of Shaphat, which poured water on the hands of Elijah. All right. John 13, 4 through 5. This story, we're switching to of the Last Supper, where Jesus washes the feet of the disciples. He riseth from supper and laid aside his garments and took a towel and girded himself. After that, he poureth water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded. In these scriptures specifically, we see Jesus assume the responsibility of a hired servant or maybe even a slave, someone who's not even paid to get down and wash the feet. As they watched, they watched as he humbled himself one by one before men and washed their feet. In those, day, in those days, foot washing was a way of cleanliness as courtesy and as a hygiene because they had open foot sandals and they're getting all the sand and dust on their feet, so they wanted to clean their feet before they came into the house. But even though foot washing may not look like much to some, Jesus was setting a pattern for what real ministry looks like even today in all of our lives. Within 72 hours from this last supper where Jesus washed the feet, Pontius Pilate also uses a basin of water. But he has a very different use case. So over here we have Jesus with his basin of water, and over here we're going to have Pilate with his basin of water. Jesus uses his basin to serve. Pilate uses his basin to excuse. Jesus uses his basin to humble himself. Pilate uses his basin to to defer his responsibility. Pilate claims that the coming death of Jesus would not be on his hands. We see here that there is a very conflicting difference between the uses of the two basins of water. 
in a continuation of the Last Supper, John 13, 6. Then cometh he to Simon Peter, he is Jesus in this verse, and Peter saith unto him, Lord, dost thou wash my feet? So Peter here is questioning why the master is down on his knees. The way that Peter sees Jesus, if I can put this into uh, a way to help understand, he sees Jesus as the president, and Peter sees himself as someone next to him, like the vice president or someone in his cabinet. So if Peter's seen Jesus get down on his knees and be a hired servant, Peter's got to be below that, and Peter doesn't want to be that low in um, service. As we read in 2 Kings 3, 4 through 12, there are two kings joined by a third. They have confided against the great enemy Moab, and the Moabites were a perpetual thorn to the uh, children of Israel, to God's people. Throughout all of their history, Moab has hated Israel. One thing that I really find interesting about the Moabites and the lineage of Jesus is that Ruth was a Moabite, and she was woven into the lineage of Jesus, and uh, she was part of the reason that Jesus was able to come and be born on this earth. Jehoshaphat, being one of the three kings, asked if there was a prophet of God that they could call upon before they would engage with the enemy. When a name was brought forth, it wasn't just any name. It was a name that matched the key qualifications found in the same room of the Last Supper. The description of the name given was he that poured water on the hands of Elijah, which meant he served. See, they could have, they could have referred to Elisha as the one that did miracles because he has notable miracles in the Bible. But instead of referring to him as the one who did miracles, they referred to him as the one that poured water on the hands of Elijah, the one that served. I don't want to be known by a message that I preach or a lesson that I may teach one day. I don't, I'm a video creator. I don't want to be known by a video that I make or something that I create or by my company that I'm starting, Northern Films. I don't want that to be why I'm known. I want to be known as someone who got down to wash the feet, someone who washed the hands of someone, someone who served. See, I believe that there's a reason the Bible says that we're going to hear one, well done, thou good and faithful servant. We don't, it doesn't say in the Bible that we're going to hear, well done, thou good and faithful person, because God is laying out that he wants us to be a servant, which relates back to how he led us in the Last Supper. It's not your name, it's not your rank, or your kingship, it's your servant, if you're a servant. If you want to know about growth and conversions of people and retention of people, I can tell you with one word, serve. A widow woman in the Bible prepared her last meal for her son. Some of you may know this story. Her son heard the voice of the prophet saying, let me eat first. And instead of the widow woman accusing him of being greedy or selfish and accusing her of trying to take all her food, she did what the prophet asked for. And in a time of famine, her oil never ran dry and she never ran out of flour. She was blessed. You know why? Because she served the prophet first. She knew how to wash the hands of the prophet, and she found the one thing that Peter missed that night when Jesus was washing the feet of the disciples. Here it is. There is no anointing without washing first. Our anointing comes from God because I serve him, but that's not the only anointing that we need. We need the anointing of the people. When we serve the people, they anoint us. David was anointed to be king by Samuel, but he didn't become king until the people anointed him. The people anointed David because he served the people. How did he serve the people? He took 400 rejected men and made them into mighty warriors. Then when we have the anointing of God and the anointing, people, uh, the anointing of people, things break loose. There are no positions in this kingdom, in God's kingdom, without being a servant. Because in his kingdom, the lower we go, the greater we are. If Jesus, the one who healed the sick, hmm, the one who walked on water, my master, my savior, the one who's called I am, can get down on his knees and humble himself before man and wash the feet of the people. Why can't I? I'm not supposed to be above my master. I don't want to be above my master, so I'm going to serve because that's what he wants me to do. When we receive the Holy Ghost, we receive an anointing. Everyone that is born again are kings and priests in God's kingdom. Like in the Old Testament, when oil would be poured over their head, we receive a spiritual anointing when we receive the Holy Ghost. We need the anointing. 
We are dead in the water without the anointing. And we were given the Holy Ghost, and we need the anointing of the Holy Ghost. Yes, it's going to come through prayer and fasting and devotion, but don't discount the washing of the hands and feet of others. I believe that if there's one thing that will change our families, it is if we can learn to serve each other. If we look in the Bible, there's two types of water that Jesus presents. The first being baptism, water baptism in Jesus' name, and the second, the basin. The baptism is for the washing of your sins, but the basin is for the washing of your heart. From what I know, there are only two institutions that exist for non-members, the hospital and the church. Their goal is to assist the people that aren't a member of the church. Watch this now. Because the church, the church is not here for us. That might be hard to hear, but the church doesn't exist for us. Let me prove it to you. If the church was only here for us and no one else, God would have already called his church home because we would have no purpose here. But he's got the church here for the non-members, for others. Let me show you some examples, some people that I've seen in my home church in Green Bay. First of all, we have Brianna. She came into church at a young age, full of depression, contemplating suicide. She got involved with our photography team. And now at the age of 17, she's in charge of our Common Grounds coffee shop. And now every Sunday, because she had a passion for coffee, serving coffee, there's five to six youth that are creating relationships serving coffee in the coffee shop. But we don't serve coffee. We serve love and kindness. Love and kindness is the why, like why we serve. But what we serve is the coffee. And now, because of that coffee group, we have Eden. She's 12 years old, brand new in church. Eden uh, began to work in the coffee shop and see the other teenagers teaching her how to serve. And now Eden has the Holy Ghost, is baptized in Jesus' name. Her dad was demon-possessed. God delivered him and filled him with the baptism of the Holy Ghost and was baptized in Jesus' name, as well as her mom is baptized in Jesus' name and filled with the Holy Ghost. Now her mom and her dad serve on different teams in the church, and God is using them to evangelize their friends and family, and they bring many people to church. Next, I want to tell you about Garrett. He's a military vet. He served several tours of combat. He came into church and got around those serving love and kindness, and God filled him and his wife with the Holy Ghost, and now they are serving in several capacities. Another lady named Karen, she's 62 years old. She was hosting a life group, and she invited someone that has never been to our church, that had never been to our church. When she came in contact with people in the life group, she began... uh, She came in contact with people serving her love and kindness, and now she's baptized in Jesus' name. And we're believing that God is going to fill her with the Holy Ghost because it is promised. I have noticed that there has been a whole nother level of anointing in our services because people are attracted to those who serve. In the last three or four years, we've begun to do our best to serve our community in various ways, and Uh, I'm going to share a story that will kind of relate to uh, the Dills. So um, the village that our church is in, it's called the Village of Howard. They, um, my my family and I live in a a off city called Pittsfield. And uh, there's a house that was right next door to our house. And um, all of a sudden, the people living there put a for sale sign up. And uh, we're like watching it because we want to see who our new neighbors are going to be. And then um, all of a sudden, the for sale sign's gone. Like two weeks go by, we don't see anybody pulling in the driveway. We're like, what is going on here? So we saw a news article saying that the village that we live in, Pittsfield, is running out of water. And they're trying to get water from Green Bay, but Howard is trying to give their water to Pittsfield. Does that make sense? They're trying to overtake Pittsfield's land. And uh, so basically, Howard bought the house that is right next to our house. And the house is sitting empty for the next year, 60, uh, six months, 12 months to a year, something like that, and uh, just because they're going to run city water to it. Um, they're trying to annex in different properties around Pittsfield. So we decided to call the village of Howard and see if they really did buy the house. And 
Um, turns out they did buy the house and they are allowing us to have my grandparents stay there rent free if we painted and changed the carpet out. And what they said is they love Meadowbrook. So because of the impact that my church had, that Meadowbrook had in the community, in the village of Howard, it opened up a position that only God could do, in my opinion. God made a way for them to have a place to stay. You could stand with me. People are hungry for the real McCoy. People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. You do this through serving. Jesus said, how do you know that you're my disciples? In John 13, 34, and 35. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all will know that you are my disciples, if you have love one for another. When you're in the place of cleaning, or mowing the grass, or painting, you're not serving the grass or paint. You're serving love and kindness, because you're giving a good representation. If you want to turn this city upside down, you're already anointed by God. But if we can find a place of service, this city will turn upside down. If we can become more like our master and be a servant, the anointing of others will come. If you want to be one of those people that make a difference, if you want to pick up the mantle of service, would you come to the altar and seek the Lord with me?